Father, we, we thank you um, so much for who you are. I say that all the time, Lord, but I, if I sat here and just started naming off all your qualities, all your attributes, we, we would just spend our service um, doing that, and there wouldn't be nothing wrong with that. Um, but, Lord, we want to get into your word, and, Lord, we just want to recognize and thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love, your patience with us. Thank you that when we go veer off to the right or to the left, Lord, you're, you're faithful and to draw us back to you, to keep working on us, to keep speaking to us. And Lord, when we were, before we knew you and we were far off and, and didn't know which way to go and we were lost in this world, Lord, you were faithful to draw us to you so we could come to know you. You took the scales off and we, we just thank you so much. And thank you that in the midst of today, you are ever present help. And, uh, and tomorrow and from here on. And thank you for the promise we have in you, Lord Jesus. Um, thank you that we get to spend eternity with you. We have a hope. And so, Lord, as we get into your word this morning, um, we just pray, God, that you would lead. To, you, you know, I have notes here um, that I pray were led by you. But if I've slipped something in there in my flesh, Lord, I pray you get rid of it and that you would uh, you. Whatever's said here this morning would be said by you, by your Holy Spirit, be led by you. And Lord, you give us hearts to receive what you have to speak to us. And so we, uh, we count on you, we lean on you, and we thank you that we can do that. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, so I did get to listen to the teaching uh, from last week, really enjoyed Pastor Jim Young's teaching. It was really good. And as I was, you know, we talked about it Wednesday night at a um, small group. And, you know, listen to that, um, that teaching about faith. And, you know, aren't you glad it's not up to us? I mean, aren't you uh, um, glad it's not up to us to work our way to God? Uh, I mean, I'm so thankful for that, um, that from the beginning, from the, from the very start, it's been about God. Um, it's been about faith in him. It's not about our works and what we can do. And the focus, the lens has not been on us. It's been on, it's always on him. Uh, so this morning we're going to be in um, Romans chapter 13. Um, if you want to mark in your Bibles as well, we'll be in First Peter. Um, and we'll kind of go start, we'll uh, read a little bit in chapter 1 and we'll read a little bit in chapter 2 as well. Um, but... We've seen in this letter, and I'd, I like to sum, kind of summarize the letter, this letter of the Romans, because as we get deeper in it, sometimes we can forget what we've read, right? As we, we can open the Bible into a certain passage, and if we don't have it in context, we can miss things. So, you know, just to summarize again, and, and this really um, is really a lot of what just Pastor Jim Young was teaching on last week. Only by faith can man obtain righteousness. Um, and that's what we're learning here in Romans. So I'm just going to go through a few scriptures that we went through already. Romans 3, 9 should be up here. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged that both Jews and Greeks, that they are all under sin. So we're all, the ground's level at the cross. Uh, Romans 3, 27, 28. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what, by what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Romans 4, 1 through 4 says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So the word is showing us over and over from the Old Testament to the New that we need God to do it. Um, whether it's salvation, Romans 3.26 says to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he, he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus or the fact that we need him to lead, lead a, this godly life we want to live. Um, there's tons of scripture for that, but Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So would you agree that it's always been about God? And it always will be, right? 
Um, if it's going to get done, God's going to do it. And in Romans 8, coming further in the letter, we also see that there is this future hope. Um, again, this hope is in the Lord. Romans 8, 24, 25 says, for we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So we are waiting on a promise of an inheritance, not in this world, um, not one that we can see, uh, but a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Uh, Hebrews 12, 28, 29 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire for the Jew and the Gentile. This is for all that are in Christ Jesus. And then we came to chapter 12, our previous chapter, where we have been given practical ways to conduct ourselves while living out our faith. Um, that as we walk out our faith, we point to God. We point to Jesus uh, walking in the spirit. Uh, verse nine of chapter 12, it says, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil. Um, verse 21, the last verse before we get to this section we're about to go into, it says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So that's a lot of scripture right away. But keeping all this in mind, we come to chapter 13. Um, and it's more right here. We're going to see this is more practical Christianity. This is more practical instruction, more pointing to Jesus with our conduct. Um, and pointing to Jesus with our conduct, conduct is a dying process. You ever notice how, um, I mean, it was hard for me to come to salvation to begin with because I just um, thought I didn't need God really. Um, but when I came to salvation, the forgiveness part and the like promise of heaven was really cool. Like that was like, yes, that's awesome. That's I really uh, appreciated that. I wanted to grab a hold of that. These instructions were a little bit more difficult for me. This following Jesus thing was a little bit more difficult when, you know, when it was heaven and it was forgiveness and being clean, like, OK, great. Awesome. And then the instructions started coming and it was like, well, wait a minute. That means I've got to change. That means I've got to die. That means I've got to yield. And so we're going to continue to cover some of those practical, um, just uh, just as practical Christianity and way we're supposed to walk out our faith. And we remember we do this how in Christ. Right. It's got to be God. It's got to be the Holy Spirit. Um, so the subjects we'll cover today seem to be a little bit more touchy to a lot of people. Um, and it's mostly touchy depending on who's in political office. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'm normally would never bring this up, but here we are. Uh, it's been brought up for us. Um, cause we're here, you know, there's somebody, uh, I think it was, uh, I can't remember. My name was Paul the other day at small group. He said, I said, I, I thought about just skipping this chapter. And he says, well, it's chapter 13. So some, I think on the elevator that there's no 13th floor. So, but we're not going to do that. We're going to, we're going to hang in there. Uh, but y'all look, I'm hanging in there. Y'all got to hang in with me. Um, we got Larry at the door. He, he's not letting anybody out. The, 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 the doors are barred. No, I'm just kidding. If there's a fire. Go out the door. Um, so I hope and pray the Lord leads us. As we study this and so know my heart that I love you guys and um, I hope you love me too. Uh, so I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time on verse one. We're going to hang out there for a little bit because if we don't get verse one, uh, I don't feel like we're going to be able to get the rest. Uh, we're going to try to uh, cover a little bit of this chapter. And I want to say this also. The Bible is not an American book. Um, it's a it's written for the world, Right. And so um, here at first, I'd like to take a broader view, uh, a, a bigger view than our own circumstances. Let's look at a, look at this in a broader view than just what we're going through here in America at first. And we can we can apply it, but let's try to keep in mind a bigger a bigger audience. Um, so verse one, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. 
That's a lot, right? That's heavy. Um, now, we know that God has all authority, right? We understand this. Um, and the difference between us and an atheist, someone that doesn't believe in God uh, or doesn't believe in any higher power, is the atheist view on authority is made up. Uh, it can change, right? And it, it changes on uh, by the way they're feeling of what's right and wrong to them, um, what's most important to them, right? So um, authority is fluid sometimes when it comes to folks that don't recognize a ultimate authority like we do. So we, we recognize that um, we believe in that God has ultimate authority, and we see here um, that we know that if I pause certain times, just know I'm trying to get my words right. We know that if he has ultimate authority, then all authority that is, is from him. Because it says here, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Would you agree that says that? Is that in your version? Okay. All right. So, um, so here's the question. What if, what if the authority, what if the government is bad? What if it's corrupt? And that's a legitimate question, right? I mean, I don't think that's a bad question. So we look to Scripture. Um, and so we look here, even in Romans, and we say, okay, what kind of authority had God appointed in place when God wrote, when Paul wrote this letter, when God penned this letter, the Holy Spirit penned this letter through Paul? And it, at this time, Nero had been appointed uh, authority during this time. Y'all you know anything about Nero? I've talked a little bit about him a couple times, I think. Nero is considered to be one of, one of history's greatest criminals. Um, now, when Romans was wrote, this was before Nero had really started this great persecution against Christians. So you might think, well, it was a little bit easier to be under subjection under Nero if he wasn't persecuting uh, the Christians. But thankfully, we have a scriptural example for that time as well while he was persecuting the Christians. And Peter wrote during that period, um, and we're going to look at what he has to say to the believers. So if you'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion, so these people were being dispersed um, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Beth Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of, of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls." And we'll come back and we'll look uh, more at Peter's letter to these Christians later. But here we see that there is a recognition of God doing a work in the midst of this. He's doing something in these people. Um, and there are several examples of this. Um, Pharaoh was raised up by God, right? Do you agree? Yes, it says it. Okay. <laughs> Obviously, Herod and Pilate during Jesus' uh, time on this earth, they were appointed by God. And we can see, if we look at each one of those situations, and I'm sure we can look at that at every situation that we don't even have recorded in the Word, but we see these that are recorded in the Word. We see the purpose of God in appointing these people to authority. God did a work. 
Yes? All right. I'm just making sure you guys are still with me. I see people looking at the door, and I'm just like, just hang on. So there has always been a purpose, and there always will be a purpose. It, it will ultimately be for good. Why? Because God is good, and his word is true. And so if authority exists by God, it's, if it's from him, and we Christians follow God, then Christians should recognize authority. That's two plus two plus two, right? Um, And we recognize it as from God. If the church doesn't believe this, then the rest of the passage here that we're going to read and much of the word of God means nothing. Not all the word of God, but there's going to be a lot of passages you're going to have to push aside. And you're going to have to, um, and sometimes people will, um, they'll do that. They'll just take little pieces out. You ever, you ever done that? I've done that. Um, it's like I come across something and I'm like, eh, you know, I don't know if it really means that. And then I'll come across the same thing again because the beauty of the word of God, and as you guys know, I put up a million scriptures every week, is that it is saying the same thing. God's word does not contradict itself. Trust me, I'm, I'm one of those Thomas guys. I've tried to find the contradictions. It, they're not there. And so he's saying the same thing. So if you don't take this for what it says, you're going to have a hard time in a lot of different passages. And so there's been people do it, actually. There's a, there's a Bible that you can actually buy. I think it's interesting. Uh, Thomas Jefferson. You can, there's a Bible called the Jefferson Bible. And you can, y'all can ever heard of that, the Jefferson Bible? So you can buy the Jefferson Bible. Um, it's called the Jefferson Bible. It's not really. The well, reason why it's called the Jefferson Bible is because what he did is he, he took a razor blade and a pair of scissors, and he cut out sections of the Bible that he liked and didn't like, and he text pasted them in and made his own little book. And so what he did is he would, that was his Bible. It was his private. He didn't, he didn't publish it because he knew back in that time, if you did that, like you were going to get hammered over the head. So it came out, you know, they, he, he passed it down to somebody. And so basically this book really is called the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth. And it was completed in 1820 by cutting and pasting with a razor and glue numerous sections from the new Testament as extractions of the doctrine of Jesus. Jefferson condensed composi- his condensed composition excludes all miracles by Jesus and most mentions of the supernatural, including sections of the four gospels that contain the resurrection and most other miracles and passages that per- portray Jesus as divine. So we got to understand that some, a lot of our, or some of our founding fathers, at least maybe a lot of them were enlightened. They were in the enlightenment. That was a big thing going on then. And they didn't really like this whole supernatural thing. It just didn't make sense to them, but they loved those moral teachings. They liked the sermon on the Mount. They liked those type of things. And so, um, Jefferson just made his own, the things he was uncomfortable with. He goes, I think I'm just going to take that out. And the ones he liked, he kept them in. And we can do that if we're not careful because we have to recognize, we have to be, it's, it's wise to recognize that we have biases, right? Um, growing up here in the mountains, um, when I first got saved, and I heard it before I got saved, but when I first got saved even, so that's been 20, 99, was it 99 when I got saved? So um, 23, 24 years ago. So um, I remember we were going to revivals. A revi- there's revival season around here, if you guys don't know. And so you go around and you go to revivals. And, you know, right now it's a pretty good starting to go revival season. It'll happen again in the fall, usually. And so I went to this revival, and, I, you know, I'm married to Bridget. And uh, so she wasn't with me, but I was there with a bunch of guys from the church, and this guy was teaching out of the Bible why it's ungodly and sinful for a white guy to marry a, a black woman and the races to be mixed. And so some of the, one of the guys I was with was amen in the guy. So it was like, do you, you, know, you know who you're sitting by? But <laughs> our, our kids went to school um, with people uh, that would tell them, because they're, they're biracial, that told them that they were born in sin because their mom and dad were uh, in, a, in, a, in a interracial marriage, so, and that their preacher told them so. And so, you know, what we can do, we look at that and we go, what? Like, how can that be? Where do you find that in Scripture? And I'll give you some Scripture if you want. And I mean, I know the Scriptures. They, I mean, they don't hold water. Um, but they wanted that to be true. Do you understand what I'm saying? They wanted that to be true, so they read it into the Bible. 
And that has happened for his, over just hundreds and hundreds of years through history. People have read what they wanted to read into the Bible or took what they wanted to take out of it and used it for what they want to believe. And we don't do that, right? It's verse by verse, precept upon precept. And that's what I love about reading and studying the Word like we do, that we cherish truth. Um, we may struggle with it. Look, I'm not telling you not to struggle with it. And we may mess up sometimes. We may trip over our old stuff, our old biases, but we continue to read God's Word, and we continue to seek to understand it in context, and we seek to submit to it. Amen? Um, so, verse 2. <laughs> Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So since we understand that authorities are appointed by God, then we understand that resisting authority is resisting God. That's what it says. Um, we know what happens. You, you guys know what happens when you resist God, right? There's consequences to that. And... We don't want those consequences. Now, here's the question. Are there exceptions? Yes. Thank you. Yes. When the authority tells us to do something that opposes God's authority, right? When the government tells you to do something that opposes what God says to do. Uh, we see this in Egypt when the midwives were told uh, to kill the babies. They resisted. They didn't do it. Um, we see it when Daniel was told not to pray, and he did it anyway. We see this in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were told to worship the, the um, idol, and they would not do it. And we see this also in the New Testament. So, though, you know, we all got all these Old Testament examples. We also see this in the New Testament with the apostles. So in Acts uh, chapter 5, verse 26 to 29, it says, Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And this is bringing, they were grabbing the apostles and arresting them. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name, in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and indeed, and, and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Like, we're going to go evangelize. They're saying, don't evangelize. God says to evangelize, we're going to obey God. Uh, so there's the answer. When it comes between obeying authority or God, we obey God. But I think it's important to read on a little bit here um, and, and see kind of what was the apostles' reaction. Like, how did they uh, stand in their rebellion? What did their rebellion look like? So after the religious leaders, um, you know, kind of heard what they had to say, just condense this a little bit, they got pretty upset, and they're like, let's kill them. Let's take them out. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, Gamaliel spoke up, and um, we pick up in verse 38. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan... For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So they got beat, probably pretty good. And they left there rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So their rebellion wasn't like, hey, you beat me, I'm going to beat you back. Or, you know, hey, you're telling me not what not to do, so I'm going to, you know, come against with some kind of force. What they did is they rejoiced that they were able to suffer for Christ's sake. And, that they, and their response also was, I'm going to go keep evangelizing. Yes? So biblically, we see rebellion is okay in submission to God's word. Biblical rebellion some doesn't really look like most of us think rebellion looks like, right? We think rebellion is something else. Um, it's not to turn the government into the church. The, this kingdom here on the earth and our kingdom are two different kingdoms. Um, I'm going to there's a sign there was a sign I mentioned this one time I think in a men's study but there was a sign down the road 
back when things really got heated with um, the lockdowns and, and a lot of other things, and there was a sign of the church, and I won't name the church, but it said, um, on their marquee, it said, do you want your freedom? Fight for it. And it had Luke twenty two thirty six. So I'm going to read that to you. Then he said to them, but now, this is Jesus, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. So the meaning of the sign was, want your freedom? Go fight for it. Go get you a sword. Jesus said so. Well, there's, we could do a whole study on that. But I'm going to tell you what Jesus said in John 18, 36, when he's talking to Pilate. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So there's another meaning. If you guys want to talk about it sometime, I'd love to sit and expound on that a little bit. I have studied it out because I struggle with that passage. But... Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. So ours isn't either. The um, Bible says that we are aliens. Not the kind with the triangle face, but we're aliens. We're, we're sojourners here. We're pilgrims. We're ambassadors for Christ. Um, the kingdom that we are of is above any earthly kingdom. Now, I'm talk, still talking globally. We're talking to every Christian in the world right now. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good, to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be un unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. So governments are here to keep order. Um, and, and most of the time, that's, like, that's true, right? I mean, even in whatever government you want to be under, um, there's usually there, like, don't murder. If you, get, if you murder in most countries, you're going to be in trouble. If you steal in most countries, you're going to be, in, no matter what government, you're going to be in trouble, right? I mean, there's things that you do that just are moral things. The government is there to keep order. Um, and then the awesome thing about Christianity is that we, if we believe this word, what it tells us to do, we can live under any government in the world and be good citizens. Do you realize that? That's pretty crazy. That God laid it out to where no matter what government pops up, there's, you, know, there, you know there's Christians in Russia. There's Christians in the Middle East. There's Christians all over the world that are living under those governments. Now, I'm not saying they're not persecuted for their faith, but their, their everyday life does not get them persecuted. Does that make sense? So they're, they're, they're able, Christians should be the best citizens in any nation as far as just outwardly how we conduct ourselves. Um, we should be light as much as it depends on us, um, seeking to do what is good. Verse 4, For he is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So if a Christian does something bad, and I'm not saying that, I mean, this is, we've already established that we can, we can oppose the government's rule if it opposes, we're, we're, we obey God rather than the government, right? When it comes to that. But other than that, if we're out of line and we catch it, it's on us. Because God has put that government in place. He's put that authority there. And the government is there to punish right and wrong. And most of the time, like we just talked about, that's the case. Like they actually do that. Most governments do that. Um, and those that don't, they are held accountable by God. Uh, Pharaoh was held accountable by God, right? He was appointed by God and he was held accountable by God. Nero was held accountable by God. Pilate was held accountable by God. Herod, if you read what happened to him, he was held accountable by God. Um, but the interesting thing here is those folks weren't held accountable by God's people, not by the church. Um, God held them accountable. And, and someone might say, well, God used Israel to defeat evil. He did. He used Israel to purge the land. But Israel was a theocracy. You understand the difference between Israel and the church. Um, the church is not called to do that. The church tried to do that. The church tried to be a theocracy in the Middle Ages. Remember? You guys read some of that history? That didn't go too well. 
It didn't go too well for a lot of good Christians. Um, the, you know, the problem that always arises, um, if a church starts wiping out sinners, we have to start with ourselves. Amen? So verse 5. I'm asking for a lot of amens today because I just want you to know that you're okay. I want you to know you're with me. Verse 5. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. I mean, I like this. Um, it's not just, we're not just subject because we don't want the wrath of God. We don't want that judgment on us from God. We don't want those consequences. Uh, but we also do it for conscience sake. And, and what that means is, um, well, let me just read this. This, this is Peter, First Peter. This is Peter talking to the persecuted church again under Nero. Uh, I'm talking major, major persecution. I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I mean, Christians on poles lighting the streets on fire, major persecution, Not something like we've never understood or comp can comprehend um, in this country anyway. Um, so first Peter chapter two, starting at verse 11, it says, beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Therefore submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. It's pretty straightforward. Verses 6 and 7. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. I knew that song. I can't place it, though. Um, render to Caesars what's Caesars, right? Um, Jesus, when they asked him, should they pay taxes? And he wanted to see the coin. And it says, whose inscription's on it? Render to his what's his. Render to God's what's God's. We are God's. Give them what they, what's theirs. So we're, we're, now we got to recognize that even during this time, there's Roman rule, taxes weren't always fair. They, a lot of times they weren't. It says pay taxes. Um, they were doing wrong things with those taxes. It says pay taxes. Um, unless, and this is my belief, and this may be wrong, I don't know, maybe I'm speaking out of uh, turn here, but my belief is you pay your taxes unless you can't feed your family. If you can't feed your family, you feed your family. Because there's something about um, doing righteousness over the obedience as well. So um, we, we got some biblical examples of that, I believe, as well. But it also talks about this fear and this uh, meaning reverence and this honor that we give to these authorities. And that's something, I'll be honest with you, I lack right now. I lack reverence and honor for our authorities. And this is convicting. This is convicting to me. Now, this is we're going to get into a little bit more here. Trust me, I'm going to, you guys are going to be a little bit happier with me just in a minute. But <laughs> this is tough. It's tough to to feel that way and then read this and look at people and go, I'm supposed to reverence that person? I'm supposed to honor that person? I just heard I just heard that person lie out of both sides of their mouth. It's like, but I'm not honoring them. I'm not reverencing them, right? I'm reverencing God. And and right and I'm telling you, because he's the one that put them in place. And so I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna act like everything's okay. But I'm also going to give honor where honor is due because it's important as Christians, our attitudes matter in this world and the things that are going on in it. Our attitudes matter. Um, our attitudes must not look like the world's. Um, I've been seeing this some, and especially in the day that we live in, and we should be very careful as Christians um, not, that uh, we don't align uh, with the world against the government. 
There's a lot of people that we wouldn't have had a lot to talk about with them or much in common until all this stuff starts coming up. And then all of a sudden we're, we're locked arm in arm with people that don't, that are anti-Christian, but because we got one thing in common with them, it's like, Oh, okay. And so we should, um, we should at least not sound the same, um, as they do. Um, we should be a light to the atheists. Uh, to share our hope that there is hope beyond this world. Um, I, I, I really tried. I'm really trying not to get any specifically political things. So here, here's the thing. If you put a Christian, in any government in the world, if you took us and you sent us overseas and let's say I took, you know, Bill and I said, Bill, you're going, you're, you're going to the Middle East Our life should look the same. His life should look the same. And no matter, you know, his faith, how he walks out his faith should look the same. And no matter what country he's in, um, the word of God, God does not give us different instructions for Christians in different places. It doesn't say, well, you guys are over there. So you act this way and you guys are over here. So you act this way. Um, we are committed to Jesus and his word, no matter where we are. Amen. And the Christian's uh, primary identity isn't in any nation. <laughs> Our primary identity is not, primary now, identity is not in any nation. So let's talk about America. Now I feel, I'm going to tell you my feelings. I was raised in a household that was Reagan. And I loved Reagan. I still love Reagan. I actually will get on YouTube and listen to 1978 speeches by Reagan when he was before he became president, after he was governor. I love that guy. I love his ideas. I, I mean, I just love him. I'm a, I'm a Reagan fanatic. And I identify as a citizen of the United States. That's my identity as a as a, in this nation. I am a citizen. I recognize that I'm a citizen of this of the United States and I pray for the United States. I love the United States. I love liberty. I love freedom. I mean, if I didn't have it, like we don't know what we got until it's gone. Right. And so, like, I love it and we should pray for it and we should speak for it. It's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing for our children. But my primary identity is in Christ with my brothers and sisters around the world. Right. It is a bigger identity than as a U.S. citizen, that I, I should be able to look at my brothers and sisters suffering in China and go, I identify with you more than I even do my citizenship here. I, I identify with you more than I, if you're in the Middle East or wherever you're at, wherever you're, the Ukrainian Christians right now, the Russian Christians right now, I should, I, those are my, our brothers and sisters. And so as an American Christian, let's ask some questions. What's allowed? What are we allowed to do? Should we be concerned with government? Yes. First Timothy two, one through four says, therefore, ex I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. There we go. We should be concerned. We should be praying. We should be praying diligently. Can we as Christians serve in government? Should we serve? Some people say that there's no place for Christians in government. There's no place for Christians in public office, in the public square. I believe there is. Um, we see scripturally Daniel held a very high office. Um, and here's, a, here's an interesting scripture in the New Testament. When the tax collectors and the soldiers uh, came to John the Baptist in Luke 3, 12 through 4, look what was said. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, what shall, what, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. There's a perfect opportunity for John the Baptist to go, Nope, you got to get out of there. You're not to be there. But that's not what he did. He said, How you conduct yourself there should be godly. Right. Stay there. Be an influence. Be a light. Uh, do what's right. 
The thing is, when we're in the midst of being in public office or in the public square, the what we can't do is we can't get, we got to make sure we don't get wrapped up in it. Um, scripture tells us uh, a good soldier does not entangle himself with the affairs of this world. Entangle means trapped in. You ever been entangled in something? You ever been through a kudzu patch? Or like, you know, a thicket? I mean, you get tangled up in that stuff, and it's a very kind of, or like a laurel thicket. You, I've, I've crawled through laurel thickets up mountains where I'm just like, I, I about freaked out sometimes because I was pinned against the ground and I'm trapped. Don't get entangled in it. Be in it. We're to be in the world, but not of it. So be in the world, be in that office, be in that place God has you, but don't be tangled up. Don't be of it. Be a light in it. And I want to say this because it, it, we all want to be influences in our world, right? And some of us want to be really big influences on Facebook, some of us want to get out there and just be like, this is the way it's supposed to be. And this political person and this political person, you know, just let it all out. I'm going to say this to you. First and foremost, if we want to influence our culture, it should start at home. In our immediate circle of influence, it should be happening there first. If it's not happening there first, get off Facebook. Let it happen there first. And then let it go out from that circle. Amen. Okay, can Christians speak openly about government corruption? Yes, Jesus did. Um, Luke 13, 31 to 32 says, On that very day, some Pharisees came saying to him, Get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform, cur cure, perform cures that today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. A fox wasn't like we talk about now. If somebody's foxy, it, that's not what he was saying. He was saying a fox goes in and messes things up. They kill your chickens. They're in menace. And so he blatantly right out come and said, you go tell that fox. John the Baptist did it. Uh, Matthew 14, 4, for Herod had laid hold of John, bound him, and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother's, brother Philip's wife, because John had said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Called him out. It's okay for us to call out corruption. It's okay for us to say it. But let's let's speak it peaceably. Let's speak it in truth. Let's speak it in the, uh, the fruits of the Holy Spirit with self-control. And let's speak it for praying for repentance. Praying that someone would come to the Lord. And here's a side note, because it's not just about, it's not just the, the officials and the authorities that sometimes we as Christians, not talking about y'all, but Christianity can speak out against. Um, there's, a, there's a decent amount of, uh, of talk against the populace, against different pockets of certain peoples that identify certain ways. I'll just leave it at that. And if we call them out, um, we call them out in their sin, we need to consider the examples we see in Scripture. Um, there's nothing wrong about calling sin, sin, but the way we do it, we got to understand that, um, we see more harsh talk from the Bible toward religious people than we do sinners, right? Those that were holier than thou, those that got on a pedestal, we saw more rebuke of those people than we did the sinners. We actually, uh, for a real quick example, you look at the woman that was caught in adultery, we talked about this, this small group the other day. It's like, well, could you imagine right now if a woman was committing adultery with some other man's husband right up the road here, and they drug her in here and said she was just committing adultery? Some of us might react like maybe kind of harsh towards her because she was just caught with some other, some other woman's man. But how did Jesus react to her? Well, first, he told the, the religious people something, and then... He told her, where are those that condemn you? And he said, neither do I. But now he didn't just go, hey, go do whatever you want. He said, go and sin no more. Like there was, there was a, obviously she knew she was wrong. A lot of these folks are lost. And you got to, we got to understand that the same enemy we have is the same enemy they have. And we just got to be careful that we don't, um, we don't get pulled into the rhetoric of pushing them away. We got to really pray that we can point them to Jesus so they can really be free from their sin. Because me pushing them away ain't going to set them free. Amen? 
trust me, I'm not saying, don't come up to me later and go, you're saying to embrace our sin. No, I'm saying that recognize who we are before take the, take the beam out before you start getting specs. So here's the thing. We are told in scripture to lay up traitors in heaven, right? Not on earth. Um, I'm going to say this. There is no earthly kingdom right now that is eternal. It's not going to be. Israel's the closest thing we get. And they're, they're becoming one. And that's going to look different than what it does now when it's in eternity. But there is a kingdom that is eternal. Of this kingdom, there will be no end. Christian, your identity is of that kingdom. That authority. As we live here on this earth, let's pray that we represent that kingdom. Um, let love, that love would compel us so others will see. Not anger, not wrath, but love would compel us. Love would move us. That, um, that we would tell others about the king of that kingdom. Uh, the one who holds all authority in heaven and in earth. And um, from what I see in God, God's word, that's his will. I'm going to read this scripture here in Acts. Um, this is a um, Jesus, as far as I know, his last earthly, as he's getting ready to uh, um, ascend, he, he, he gives this last command. It's in Acts 1, 6 through 8. And it says, therefore, when they came, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you sit at this? Will you? Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's what we're called to do. That's our primary calling. If you're looking for a purpose in life, there's your calling. To be a witness for Jesus. What that looks like, we've talked a lot of different ways. It's how you conduct yourself. It's what you say. It's how you interact. It's how you're in the world, but not of it. It's what's going on at home and how that influence is happening there and spreading out. It's how we react. It's tough though, right? It's dying. But we, those that lose their life, what? Gain it. Jim, you want to come up? As we close, I just want to ask in general, I mean, I know about most of you guys, but maybe there's someone here. Um, I just want to ask everybody, where's your identity? Um, because the reality is, as much as we want to hold on to this kingdom here on earth, eventually, I hope it's a long time down the road. I hope it's hundreds of years from now. But one day this kingdom will fall. It's biblical. And if you don't know Jesus... When this life is all over, you will be separated from him forever. That's truth. That's Bible. Um, you don't hear about this much no more, but the place where those separated from God, where they go, it's called hell. People don't like to talk about hell. I don't like to talk about hell. You know the worst thing about hell? It's God's not there. I'm sure there's other things that are very bad about it, but it's got the worst thing has to be that God's not there, that his love's not there. The Bible said it, that hell has been prepared for the devil and his angels. So you could say that it wasn't made for you, but your sins have separated you from God. But Jesus has made a way for you. He took your sins and nailed them to a cross. Colossians 2, 13 through 15 says this, and I want you to listen. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them trying triumphing over them in it God has made a way for you to enter his kingdom and you know the best thing about that kingdom 
God's going to be there. I can't wait. I'm not worried about the streets of gold or, you know, I'm, I mean, there's questions about that anyway. I don't, I don't care about no mansions. I want to go be, be near Jesus, the one who loves me and loves you. So I'm just going to ask you today, if you don't know him, submit to him today. Be clean, be free, and receive the promise of a kingdom that cannot be shaken, that will not fade away. We're going to take a few minutes with the Lord here. Um, There'll be some people here, I'm assuming, to pray. And if you're not, I'll come down and pray with you. Um, But please, if you need prayer, um, please come up and receive prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for truth. We thank you, Lord, that in the midst of all the ideas, all the proclamations, all the speeches, all the statements, all the blogs, all the videos, your word is truth. And so, Lord, please, God, forgive us for all the times we've resisted. Continue to be patient with us as we battle through our our own biases, maybe our own past, our own resistance to your truth. Help me. You know, you know me, Lord. And Lord, help us. As we want to react, help us be still and wait on your wisdom. Wait on your Holy Spirit to lead us. Give us the grace to live a life that glorifies you, Lord Jesus. You're worthy. There is no doubt you're worthy. So, Lord, uh, we just pray that in our little circle of influence, that it would start there in our house. And then it would spread and move out from there. And then in this church, Lord, we would live our lives to glorify you, to live our lives to point to you in every aspect of our life. That you get us there. And thank you for your mercy that you show as we get there. And Lord, we pray for anybody here this morning that may not know you. Lord, we pray that they would uh, just say yes to you. They would submit their lives to you as, as Lord. Because without you, everything in this world is trying to be their Lord. All the confusion, all the chaos, all the darkness. But Lord, Lord Jesus, when you're their Lord, there's peace and there's life and there's truth. There's mercy and there's grace. There's an abundance of unconditional love. 
We thank you. So, Lord, we just pray for them, especially this morning and all those out there beyond these walls. Give us the grace, Lord, to reach them. We just thank you so much. We pray for our leaders. We pray for those that you've put in authority. We may not agree with them. We may not agree with them very strongly. But, Lord, we pray for them. And we pray that they would have righteousness in their life from you. They would submit to you. They would know you. Lord, they would turn away from their sin and they would turn to you. Lord, they would rule with righteousness. And we will never look to them as our hope. We will always look to you. But Lord, we do pray, Lord, that they would be an extension of your grace in our our country. And we pray for the countries all around the world. We pray for our brothers and sisters everywhere. Lord, as they stand and for you in corrupt governments and in places that are way worse than we, we've ever seen here. And those, Lord, that are in places that it's going really good, Lord, let them stand. Let us stand. Let your church, Lord, be alive in this world. We thank you. We thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. You've called us to be your witnesses. It's all about you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.